It happened that when the international military trial was over, we had shown pictures, called witnesses, thousands and thousands of such documents, proving beyond any doubt that the charges were fully justified on the facts. And uh, it has often, you know, been said, well, was this victors of vengeance? Was this the victors just trying to get even with the Germans? And I can assure you that that was not the case as far as the United States was concerned. The British were quite prepared to have a political solution, as they called it. A political solution meant you don't give them an opportunity to make big speeches, which was the reason they gave for it. You just pick out the leading people and uh, uh, leading politicians and you shoot them. The Russians would have been happy to do the same thing, except their list would have been much longer. The French didn't have too much to say because they had been liberated by the Americans. And the Americans had a strange idea. Let's have a fair trial. Let's not just take them out and shoot them, which of course could have been done. Germany had surrendered unconditionally. If the American army had decided to go out and shoot 100,000 the first Germans they saw, nothing would have stopped them. And the Russians, too, were finally persuaded to say, OK, give them a trial, but then shoot them. And uh, the uh, British, well, if that's what the Americans want, uh, OK, if you, no, don't let them make too many speeches. Uh, so that's how it came about. And the Americans were absolutely determined to give all of the accused a very fair trial. The man who was the leading architect for the Nuremberg trials, the IMT, as well as the subsequent trials, the inspiration of his words, was an outstanding American jurist, a judge on the Supreme Court of the United States who took leave of absence with permission of the President of the United States. And the principles were absolutely clear. We are going to not only punish people for crimes against humanity, which was some new concept, although it had been coming along with crimes against the human conscience and had gone way back to declarations many, many years before, but also for the crime of aggression. And the complaint has been made now, and after the trial, it's all ex post facto law. They've never one had really tried for that crime before. They just invented that to try the Germans. Not true. People who say that just don't know the facts. I have read all the documents when I was still a student. I knew that this issue was hotly debated in the uh, League of Nations committees after the First World War, where about 20 million people were killed. And uh, the lawyers who were working on it came to the conclusion that it would be highly desirable that people should be punished for the crime of aggression. And uh, that made sense to me because, as Jackson pointed out, crimes are committed not by states. They are committed by people who are in control of those states. And if you just want to punish the people by imposing sanctions and things of that kind, or cutting off their water supply or money or whatever, you're punishing the innocent people. Whereas the guilty ones are allowed to remain free. And that didn't seem quite right. So Jackson said, look, law must apply equally to everyone. And the precedents which we lay down here today are the laws by which we should be bound tomorrow. And that was the idea. The time had come for the law to take a step forward in the interest of world peace. The rule of law would be epitomized, it's a big word, we demonstrated by the Nuremberg trials. And uh, the United Nations would deal with social justice, disarmament, the creation of an international military force, to maintain the peace in future years, the Security Council to be entrusted with the authority to stop wars because they were the only ones who had the power at that time to do that. So it was part of a vast plan to create a more humane world. That's what Nuremberg was about, to hold accountable those leaders who are really the ones who send the young people like you off to go out and get killed 
and kill other young people who you do not know for the reasons which you do not quite understand and are not quite convinced. Patriotism with the flag being waved, sovereignty is at stake, and all such business. Uh, to get at the truth and to hold accountable those who are responsible for the evil deeds which were epitomized by the German concentration camps for one, there has never been and never will be a war without atrocities. I can tell you that as a combat soldier. And the biggest atrocity of all is illegal war making. And the decision was that nobody could use force. The UN Charter prohibited the use of armed force except in the common interest with approval of the Security Council or in self-defense against an actual armed attack. These were the rules which was to guide us. Since then, at that time, we had killed another 50 million people on top of the 20 million killed. I'm talking millions of people. There's a lot of people. You have never seen a million people in your life, any one of you. If you imagine that everybody you'd ever looked at in your life was taken out and shot, you'd get some idea of what I'm talking about. Okay. So, I pitched in to do my bit. I went back to Germany, and in due course, as has been indicated by the speakers, I don't want to delay it, I uh, became the chief prosecutor for the United States in the trial against the United States versus Otto Ohlendorf et al. Uh, and uh, 22 defendants accused of murdering over a million people in cold blood. Now, where do I get that figure from? It's too round a figure. It's a round figure. One of my researchers, my first assignment was to go through the archives in Berlin and elsewhere to get, mostly in Berlin, the record of what really happened. And one of the researchers came and he gave me a three big lights ordinance. He said, take a look at this. And these were Ereignismeldungen aus der UDSSR, reports from the Eastern Front. Every day, Einsatz commanders A, B, C, and D, each one consisting of five to eight hundred men, reported we entered the town of such and such on this and this time, and within the first 24 hours we succeeded in eliminating 14,312 Jews, uh, 212 gypsies, and 142 others, or whatever. These are hypothetical figures, but reflective of what they were like. Uh, and uh, I had the name of the commander, I had the name of the place, I had the time, I had the Geheime Reichsache, I had the Verteiler list of about a hundred names who later said they knew nothing about it, including all the ministries, including the high command, etc. And I said, with this, we got to have to have another trial. It was not planned. I went down, I flew down to from Berlin to Nuremberg, met with General Taylor, who was the chief of counsel for all the 12 trials. And I said, General, we've got to put on another trial. He said, we can't. It's not in the budget, it hadn't been planned, it hadn't been approved by the Pentagon. All the lawyers are already assigned. Uh, they're busy, we have to go forward with the other cases. I said, look, I've got all this evidence. Cold-blooded, calculated, deliberate murder with the names of the murderers, and many of them probably in captivity. Well, he got a little bit annoyed, I guess, with me for not taking no for an answer, which is a good practice. And uh, he said, well, can you do this in addition to your other work? I said, sure. He said, okay, you're it. So I became the chief prosecutor, the biggest murder trial in human history. And you'll be surprised to hear, in the light of current experiences with Judge Cowell is very familiar with. I arrested the prosecution's case after two days. I didn't call a single witness. I said, I don't need them. I got their contemporaneous documents, the best evidence you can have. Witnesses would contradict themselves, would be confused, would lie, would be mistaken. I don't need witnesses. I'll convict them on their own documents. And I did. And uh, of course,